All right, so hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the last workshop for ACM ICPC before the mini contest uh, for you know beginner CP this quarter. Uh, we're gonna try, you're gonna cover a topic that we've never never done before called game theory. And the idea is just to you know try something, try a topic that's interesting, something we've never done before. And this does show up in competitive programming, so it is relevant to the things we've been doing so far. But the idea is just to have some fun, look at some cool problems, you know, try to look at some new notions of what a game means and things like that. So hopefully, even if you're not into competitive programming, you get something out of this workshop and learn a little bit, little bit more about the class, you know, the, the set of class of games called combinatorial games. So we'll get, we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so here's the agenda. We're gonna start with what is a game? So, you know, how do we even define a game for, for the purposes of our, of our workshop? Um, you know, in a, in a brief introduction to game theory, uh, combinatorial games. We're going to look at three example problems. Now, this might look like a lot of example problems for those of you who have been with us, but uh, they're just a follow up to each other. So think of it as one big example problem, which will take about 15 to 20 minutes as a, in total. Uh, once we cover some really easy problems, we're going to look at a really cool um, impartial game, and we'll get to what that means um, called NIM and how we solve NIM and other games using Grundy numbers. And the Sprog, then the Sprog Grundy theorem. So all of this is might be new to you. It was new to me when I went over it, but we're going to go over all of it together during this workshop. And finally, if we have time, uh, which I don't think we might, we're going to look at this problem called SNIM, but that's also a problem on the contest. So hopefully you can look at it there. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, so what is a game? Well, I mean, think of the most basic thing you know about a game. Does anyone want to uh, so when I say when I say let's play a game, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You know, you have, I mean, the first thing is you need some players to play a game. So you have many players with moves and strategies. You know, these moves have outcomes. So like everything you do in a game seen has some sort of result. I mean, you, you got to make progress in the game. Otherwise, what's the point? And there's some notion of a win or loss. For example, if I was in this game of tic-tac-toe and it was the it was the turn of the player who had to play the X. The, the, that player has the move, say, place X, which allows the, this, which allows the following board to transition into this board. So you have some sort of outcome. And it turns out that this is actually a winning state. So you have some sort of winning, you, you have some sort of notion of win or loss. And that, that is determined by, you know, three crosses stacked horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. So there's some sort of a notion, there's some sort of notion of a win or loss. You know, we can describe games even more generally. So I'm gonna describe, I'm gonna define a game and very informally as a well-defined interaction between two or more players. What this means is that any place you have two or more parties interacting in some form, we're gonna call that a game. And you know, this, 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 this notion is sort of really vague on purpose because, and, and also notice that this notion of a game does not have any concept of winning. And it's just, it, we're just describing it as some sort of interaction. And why does this become useful? Well, now we can actually look at games as a whole. And this could include anything from debates to diplomatic talks to economic decisions, because all of these, all of these aspects or all these real case scenarios always have some sort of parties interacting in some form or the other. And they make certain decisions. And that's all we care about as a game. So if you think of game in this way, the field of game theory is essentially just analyzing these games with competing players. What does that mean? You know, we're looking for the goal of game theory or the goal of any or analyzing any game in game theory is to discover optimal strategies and decision making. And by optimal here, we mean, you know, what is the best response or what is the best way to maximize my benefit? Like, for example, if I was to make an economic decision, what is the maximum payoff that I can achieve by making some certain by making a certain set of decisions? And that is the goal of game theory. The idea is to analyze such moves and to analyze such games and to figure out what's the best move for each player involved. You know, game theory helps us answer questions like, can I always win this game if I start first? You know, if this game has some sort of notion of winning? Or more generally, how do I respond to the last move in the best possible way to maximize my benefit? So for example, if I was playing or competing against another player and say anything like a debate or maybe an economic or an economic um, scenario, then based on what the other players did, what is my best response to maximize my benefit? This benefit could be profit, it could be you know, resources and a resource division scheme. It could be pretty much anything. And we allow this because of our really generic description of a game. 
that's kind of interesting. I mean, you, you, you normally don't think of games this way, and you normally think of games with some sort of winning or loss. And we're going to come to those kind of games in a bit. That's actually going to be the focus of our workshop. But just to give you a little, just to give you a little taste of what game theory is, let's look at games in this really generic fashion. Okay, so with that, let's look at some types of games. So we're going to focus on two-player games for the rest of this workshop. And everything that I talk about is going to be in reference to these two-player games. Okay, so what, what are the first type of games that we're going to look at? I mean, that we're going to talk about? These are zero-sum games. And the idea is, in a zero-sum game, firstly, there's no notion of winning or loss, but uh, winning or losing. But the idea is that anything that I lose is exactly your game. And anything that you gain is exactly my loss. To consider some examples, we have the game of poker, the game of chess and resource division. So poker essentially is that the money that's put in the pot is exactly the money that I gain as the winner or the winner of that round. So, I mean, yes, you can describe a notion of winning by based on uh, how much gain some, some, some person gets, but that idea is completely independent of the game. That, that idea is completely independent of zero sum games. So the idea is like how much ever money is put into the game is exactly the amount of money someone gains out of the game. Similarly, in chess, you could define uh, you could define uh, a loss to be negative one, and a gain and a and a win to be positive one, and a tie to be half half. So the idea is like um, the the the, con the the sum of the winning the win and loss is always constant at the end of the round. Uh, we, uh, you could think of resource division in real world. For example, if you have a limited set of resources and two players are competing to gain some sort of, some amount of those resources. The, if I gain more resources, that means you gain fewer. So my gain is exactly your loss. But you know, these games could be quite restrictive. You might wanna look at more general gains in the case where my loss is not necessarily your gain. I mean, we have independent, independent losses and gains. They're not sort of related to each other. And uh, you know, we could look at a game that has different losses and gains based on outcomes. And we're gonna look at a really popular example known as the prisoner's dilemma which we're gonna to come to in a bit. Because you know, I think no workshop on game theory is complete without, uh, addressing the, without addressing the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, so notice that we still have no notion of winning so far, just losses and gains. And we're gonna to get to this, you know, and turns out there's actually a whole class of problems called combinatorial games that are whole, wholly determined by winning, by winning and losses. But we will revisit this in a later slide. Okay. So let's focus on the prisoner's dilemma. You know, uh, suppose, think of the following problem. Suppose you have two prisoners who, uh, who were convicted for some, joint, uh, for some joint crime, but the cops do not have enough information to convict both the prisoners for a really long sentence. They do have some, they do have some, uh, they do have some information so that they could convict them for at least uh, two years, but they want one of the prisoners to confess. So that the other prisoner, so that they can, you know, if someone confesses, they get more information and they're able to convict either one or both of the prisoners for a longer sentence. So, you know, we're, we're going to look at this as from the perspective of the prisoners. As prisoners, we want to minimize our sentence as much as possible, right? And if you think about it, um, if you notice, if you look at the grid here, the most optimal or the best strategy for both the players would be to remain silent. You know, if they both remain silent, both of them get off with just a sentence of two years. But if anyone else decides to do anything else, for example, if prisoner B decides to confess and prisoner A decides to remain silent, A gets a sentence of eight years, but B gets a sentence of one year. But as a whole, you know, A is getting a huge, bigger, much bigger loss. So we're also going to assume that prisoner A and B had no, uh, had no time to discuss anything before they, they were, uh, before they, they were made, they were forced to make their decision. And, yeah, if you think about it, you know, if, if they had time to discuss and both decided to remain silent and they, 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 they were willing to trust each other and they had some cooperation, they would both like to get away with a sentence of two years. And if you think about it, if, if they try to do anything else, they always, all, one of them always end, ends up getting a bigger sentence. So that's something they'd want to avoid as a whole. But if you really think about it, so think about if the prisoners really don't trust each other. The prisoner really doesn't know what the other person is willing to play. So we're going to look at what is the worst case scenario for each prisoner. And to be, to, as, as to be the safest as possible, you're going to want to choose the strategy that is, uh, that is safest for you. That even if prisoner B plays the worst case uh, move, you always get the least amount of, you get the least sentence. So let's, let's look at that. So if, if you decide to remain silent, what is the worst that prisoner B could do to you? 
If prisoner B decides to remain silent, you get a sentence of two years. And remember that we're looking at prisoner A. And if prisoner B decides to confess, then A gets a sentence of eight years. So in the worst case, if you decide to remain silent, you get a, you get a sentence of eight years. Because again, remember, we, 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 we're also assuming that prisoner A and B do not trust each other or do not know what the other prisoner is going to do. So we're going to assume the worst. So if you decide to remain silent, the worst sentence that we're going to get is eight years. And if you decide to confess, uh, you know, if, if prisoner B decides to remain silent, we get a sentence of one year, that is great. But in the worst case, we actually get a sentence of five years because again, we do not know what the prisoner is going to do. So if you look at each strategy independently, if we decide to remain silent, the worst case strategy, we, the worst case outcome is a sentence of eight years. And if you decide to confess, the worst case strategy is, a, is, is so the worst case, uh, the worst case payoff is a strategy of, is, sorry, is a, a sentence of five years. Now, obviously it's better. So if I want to, if I want to optimize for my safest case, I would definitely go for the strategy of, I mean, the, the strategy that yields me five, five years as a sentence instead of eight years, because eight years is definitely worse. And I want to choose the shortest sentence possible. So in that case, I would, I would basically choose, uh, sorry, I just saw something in the chat. Let me go ahead and make sure. Oh, sorry. So I would basically like to optimize or find the strategy that gives me the shortest sentence possible. And in that case, I will actually decide to confess. And if it, and that's, that's kind of unintuitive, right? Because if both players had some sort of notion to discuss or had some time to discuss, both would have probably optimized or cooperated and both gone for two years. But if I am locally only looking at the worst case, then my safest strategy is actually to confess. Because in that case, I'm guaranteed a worst case, a worst case sentence of five years versus something that could have possibly got, gotten me eight years. And similarly, prisoner B would actually do the same. It, it would think that prisoner A, I mean, it would not know what prisoner A wants to do. And in the safe, to, to, to make sure that it gets the shortest sentence possible in the worst case, it would actually decide to confess as well. And since both decide to confess, it turns out that both end up getting a sentence of five years, whereas they both could have somehow got a sentence of two years if they could have only cooperated. And this kind of leads us to why, why we think game theory is kind of important. It turns out that even, in the, even if it's in their best interest to cooperate, we can see why they might choose not to do so, because they might be optimizing for their worst case. And game theory exactly, and you know, while this might not model real world players exactly, it's still a really powerful analytical tool. You know, it turns out that in the real world, players have some sort of cooperation bias. They're actually biased a little towards cooperation, but game theory is still, this is just a small taste of game theory. And it turns out that game theory actually allows us to you know, discover these problems more analytically and figure out what players might choose to do in certain scenarios. And based on what other players might choose to do, we can actually tailor our strategies to combat theirs and get more payoff than what we previously could. So game theory is all about just you know, behavior of, of people in various scenarios and how to maximize benefit. That's exactly, that's pretty much all game theory is. So, you know, this workshop or this entire workshop series is all about competitive programming. So what about game theory and competitive programming? How can, you know, how, how does game theory show up in competitive programming? And, you know, the, the biggest class or the, the, most, the most often way it shows up is something called combinatorial problems or combinatorial games. And in these games, there's actually a notion of winning and losing. And it turns out that there are these certain positions in the game, there's certain states in the game. So every time I make a move, I move the, uh, the game moves from one state to another. And it turns out that there's these winning and losing positions for each game. And the player wins by landing at a certain winning state or a position. And a player loses if, um, if there are no legal moves, uh, no more legal moves left to play. And a legal move basically means that, you know, there's no way for me to do anything else. You know, uh, we're going to look at some uh, we're going to look at some problems or some examples after this. That's going to make it a little clear what a legal move possibly could be. And once you have no more legal moves to play, this actually turns out um, to be losing for the player. So a player who ends up on such a state where there are no more legal moves, that means you've automatically lost the game. And the most important criteria for a combinatorial game is that the players play sequentially. So you know, you have one player playing after another. They don't make simultaneous decisions. And most importantly, they have perfect information of all the previous moves. What do we mean by perfect information? Well, this means that both players have access to the game at all times. So they, they've seen all the previous moves that every player have made. They know all the moves that a player possibly can make. So if you think of a card game where actually I hide a deck of cards from you, or I hide, or I hide a pile of cards from you, 
that is not a combinatorial game because you have no information about the cards in my hand. So that, that means you, have no, you don't have perfect information of the game. So you might think that, hey, combinatorial games might be a really small class of problems, but it turns out that's not quite true. And we're gonna look at maybe like four or five examples today and still cover a wide array of problems. And the reason they're so nice for game theory is, is sorry, they're so nice for competitive programming is that, is that there's always this notion of winning and losing. So it, it makes a lot of sense to analyze them. And it's really nice because we have this binary answer where they're saying that some player wins or loses. So it, it becomes a really nice class of problems for competitive programming. And it also turns out that combinatorial games can go on forever. You know, this is not a desirable property for games generally. For example, if you consider chess in its raw form, where uh, we don't have rules such as making three moves consecutively um, causes a stalemate or causes a draw, chess could also go on infinitely because I could keep making the same set of moves. The players could keep making the same set of moves again and again. But we obviously, we generally introduce rules in the game so that this is not possible. Okay, so it actually turns out that any combinatorial game always has a winning strategy. So it basically means like even before the game starts, you can, you're always able to analyze games to it and you should always be able to tell me whether the first player or the second player wins. And that's kind of interesting. And that's also why, that's also why we motivate combinatorial games in, in competitive programming because there's always, there's always this notion of winning strategies. And since we always have something to analyze, they become a beautiful class of problems. And it also turns out that everything is deterministic in combinatorial games. There's no randomization. There's no, there's no factor of luck, for example. So that, this makes it really nice for uh, competitive programming because everything is deterministic. So you can always, there's always something to analyze. And usually the game for such problem, usually the goal for these such problems is to find some winning strategy for output who can always win and both play optimally. I mean, optimally here means that both players play so that they never make a mistake. They always try to make, they always make the best move that gives them the maximum payoff, or they always make the best move that leads them to a win as much as possible. Okay, so we're, maybe one more thing before we get into some more concrete examples that would make sense. We're gonna look at some types of combinatorial games. So there are basically two types of combinatorial games, uh, and that is impartial and partisan. So what are impartial games? Well, impartial games are games in which both players have the same set of moves and resulting outcomes. This means that the game is common between both the players, and they both have the and they both you know make moves out of the same set. For example, in chess, chess is not an impartial game because uh, one player always moves white pieces and the other player always moves black pieces. So they have this, this they have these distinct set of moves, uh, you know, categorized by legal moves uh, and characterized by the color of their pieces. So both players have a distinct set of moves, and that game is not impartial. And we're going to look at games where we actually have a pile of stones and we're going to be picking out some stones from this pile. In that case, both players are picking out from the same from the same pile and that, that would be a case of an impartial game. And uh, these, are, these games are slightly easier to analyze because we have the same strategy set. You know, both players have the same possible strategies and the states that the game ends up in are symmetric for both players. What this means is that, you know, we haven't really talked about states yet, but it's, it's the idea that every move you make moves the game from one state to another. And it really doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, we're, we, you know, because in impartial games, we're able to look at these states independent of the player. It doesn't matter which player ends up on the state. A game could uniquely be characterized by the state. And, you know, we, ha and we also have this notion of a winning position. And the, the, the definition of a winning position is a position in the game from which the current player is guaranteed to win. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty strong. It basically means that from this position of the game, no matter what the other player does, the current player on this position is always guaranteed to win. And similarly, we also define a losing position, which is a position in the game in which the current player is always guaranteed to lose, no matter what the other player does. And this, is, this has been a lot of definitions, but we're gonna get into a concrete problem really soon. But before that, does anyone have any questions uh, of you know, what, what games are, what's game theory, what's, uh, what are combinatorial games, and what's sort of the focus of our workshop today? Uh, you're free to un unmute yourself at any time or put it in the chat. Okay, I'm just gonna wait 30 seconds. Uh, if you have any questions, then we can go ahead.
All right, seems like there are no questions. So awesome. Let's go ahead and look at our first game, uh, toy example, problem A, two stone. So for those of you who are new, Caddis is the platform we kind of use to, uh, to code out our solutions. If, if you're only here to uh, you know, learn a little bit about game theory, don't worry about it. You can just go ahead and click on that link and click on problem A to look at the first example problem. Um, I realized that the, the contest is not published yet. So let me go ahead and rectify that. Um, so let's start at, let's start at 27. And, um, and hold on. Okay, so the contest should be live in about 30 seconds. And that link should work right after that. Um, but yeah, so you know, take two minutes to read the problem. Um, it's, it's actually, a, uh, don't think too hard about it. It's actually a really simple problem. And once you have some time to think about it, we'll go straight into the solution. So you know, we're not gonna give you any time to code this one out because we want problem A, B, and C to act like one huge example problem. And then hopefully you're able to code that out in the time where I go over the solution because the solutions are not that hard. And yeah, so anyway, um, it should be live now. Yeah, the link should work now. And <clears throat> yeah, just go ahead and click on problem A as soon as you're able to uh, join. If you do not have a Caddis account, that is completely okay. Uh, if you do not want to create one, for now you can go ahead and just click on. You should be still. You should still be able to access the contest and read the problem statement. All right. So let's let's pause for two minutes, and we can get right back into. It. All right, let's, let's get right into it. Okay, so let's just break down the problem real quick. Um, so, you know, we have N stones on the ground and Alice and Bob can select any, but exactly two consecutive stones. So, you know, Alice is free to choose stones three and four, leaving a gap between the first two stones and the next few stones. Um, once no one can pick any more stones, we basically check how many stones are left. If there's an odd number of stones left, then Alice wins. And if there's an even number of stones left, then Bob wins. And it seems like the fact that you can select any two stones really adds some sort of complexity to the problem. But we're gonna think about why it actually doesn't. And in fact, we're also gonna assume that both are playing optimally, of course, which means that none, none of them are gonna make, make a mistake intentionally. Both of them are playing to win and both of them will always make a move that is best for them. All right, so let's go right into the solution. So suppose you started with an odd number of stones. Since Alice and Bob can exactly pick two stones each, how many stones are we left with after that? You're still left with an odd number of stones, right? Because if you remove two stones or a multiple of two stones from an odd number of stones, that is subtracting an even number from an odd number. And we always know that, a, that the difference of an, an, odd, an odd number and an even number is always odd. So no matter what the two players do, as long as you can make legal moves, you'll always still have an odd number of stones. And similarly, if you started with an even number of stones, if you always remove a multiple of two, you're always going to, uh, you're always going to end up with an even number of stones, right? Is that clear? Does anyone have any questions about what I just said? Okay, so what does this really mean for our problem? Well, think about, you know, the fact that this is happening will go on to the very end until the game ends. And the game ends whenever no one can make a legal move. But at that point, you're still, if you start with an odd number of stones, reducing by two stones always leads you to, an, to a state or to a game with odd number of stones. So no matter what the two players do, Alice is always guaranteed to win if there's an odd number of stones. And Bob is always guaranteed to win if there's an even number of stones. And th that's exactly what our solution is going to be. So if there's an if there's an even number of stones, then you know it's divisible by two, and we print out Bob. And if it's an odd number of stones, we simply print out Alice. And okay, this problem, you know, after looking at the solution, looks pretty simple. But notice how how constrained this problem is. I mean, it didn't it didn't even allow us to choose more than two stones. And so let's generalize this toy example a little bit. 
So instead of choosing a fixed number of stones, what if Alice and Bob can select any number of stones from a given range? Suppose they can pick any number of stones from one to three. So, I, so you know, Alice and Bob can pick either one stone, two stones, or three stones. Can we still find the player that can always win? You know, I kind of told you that in these games, you can always find, um, you, there's always a winning strategy or there's always a losing strategy, but can, can we do it somehow together in this workshop pretty easily? And the answer is yes, but let's look at some smaller examples and try to find some pattern that can allow us to do this. So in fact, we're actually gonna do this in a slightly interesting way. We're gonna model this example as a demo. So I want one of you to play with me, play this game with me. Um, anyone who wants to play it. And you know, since I'm nice, you get to go first. So you can pick any number of stones from one, two or three, and I'm gonna mark them off. And let's see who, who can win. So who, who would like to play with me? <laughs> You're free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. And uh, this is interesting. So let's see who wants to play. All right, officers, you're free to uh, you're free to you're free to raise your hand as well. I'll go. Um, All right, awesome. So officer, but... no, no worries. That's awesome. It's much better to have an attendee. So, All right, so let me go ahead and pull out my pencil. And uh, okay, how many stones would you like to mark off? I'll take three. I'll take three. Okay, so let's go ahead and mark them off. Hopefully, this works. Awesome. Hope you can guys see this. All right, hmm. I want this to be winning for me. So maybe I'm gonna go ahead and mark one stone. Okay, what, what would you like to do next? I'll take two. All right, you're gonna take two stones. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take two stones too, cause why not? And what's your last move? <laughs> I'll take two again. Okay, and now I can simply end the game by taking two stones again. And um, you know, now, the, now Jacoby has no more moves to play and that means that's automatically my win. So we could try this multiple times, but I'm basically cheating here because I know that if I go second, I can always actually win. So thank you for playing by the way. And um, yeah, so the thing is like, in fact, we're gonna look at why the player who always goes second in this case, always is guaranteed to win. And some of you might've noticed what I was trying to do there maybe. For example, whenever uh, Jacoby played three, I played one. And whenever they played two, I actually played two. So I'm maybe like, I mean, I don't know if you noticed that, but I'm trying to keep the sum at four. And um, let's see why that actually works. So let's, 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 let's dig a little deeper. So let's look at games with a multiple of four. Like the previous game had a multiple, uh, the game had a multiple of four. Now I'm going to say that a game has a multiple of four when the number of stones in that game has a multiple of four, just, just, just to you know, make it easier for me to say. And it turns out that every two turns, the player who goes second, that was me, I can always ensure that we remove a total of four stones at the end of my turn. So if you continue this, I will actually always be the one removing the last stone. To see this, let's think of uh, let's think let's think of the smallest game, uh, the smallest game that is a multiple of four. Uh, you know, maybe that's actually that's a game of zero stones. And in the game of zero stones, the player who goes first automatically loses because he has no more moves to play. So maybe let's look at a slightly non-trivial example where we have four we have four stones. In four stones, no matter what the first person plays, for example, if they play two, I can always play the the difference of four from two. Uh, which is always a legal move, because if you think about it, if one can always be countered with three, two can always be countered with two, three can always be countered with one. So I can always bring the sum back to zero. So either I can always bring the, the remaining number of stones back to zero. And if I bring it back to zero at the end of my turn, that always means that you're never going to have a move to play. And if you think about it, you can always do this for any multiple of four, because I can always bring you down to a multiple of four. And if you keep doing this, you know, one after the other, we're always gonna end up at zero. And we're gonna end up at zero at the end of my move, which means that you will have no more moves to play. So it turns out that the player who goes second always has a winning strategy if the number of, if the number of stones in the game is actually a multiple of four. Uh, but you know, so you know, we, we have now found a winning strategy for second, but does this mean that any non-multiple of four is automatically winning for the other player? And it turns out it's, that's actually true because think about what the first player could do. So suppose you had a game of 14 stones. The first player could actually play some number of stones to bring it down to a multiple of four. 
So, you know, in this case, if you had 14 stones, the first player could actually play two to bring it down to a multiple of four, which is 12. And now it's my turn. So now we can think of this new game as a sub game where I actually go first and I start at a multiple of four. So I hope that made sense. I'm gonna take questions in a second. But now the second player who's playing his first move when the game has a multiple of four stones. So you could think of this as a brand new game where the second player is actually going first and is actually starting at a multiple of four. And what do we know about games with a multiple of four? We know these games are automatically losing for the, for the, for the, for the player who goes first. In this case, the player who's going first is actually the player who went second. So in fact, it turns out that any player who goes second will, will always lose if, um, if the game is not a multiple of four. Yeah, so think about how we broke down a bigger problem into smaller subproblems. We looked at the bigger problem of n is equal to 14 stones to n is equal to 12 stones after removing the first two stones. Okay. So we're actually not gonna play this game, but it turns out that if I go second in this case, if there are 14 stones, the first player always has the following winning strategy. Sorry, let me go ahead and sorry, it's taking some time to pull out my pencil. Yeah, so the first player say, you know, I'll just go first uh, and maybe I'll just play against myself. If I go first and I uh, mark off the two stones, we could now think of this remaining game as a game of 12 stones, because now there are only 12 stones left, where the second player actually now goes first. So the player, basically the red player is now the first person who has to make a move. But now whatever the first person does, as the blue player, I can always counteract their strategy by doing the same thing. I can always bring it down to a multiple of four. So I'm gonna play this, and now I bring it down to a multiple of four. Now I always have the move to always make to make make sure that it's four, and at the end of the game, it's going to be player one that I that it's going to be player two that has no more moves to play. So let's just spend another thirty seconds making sure uh, that made sense, and you know that's something everybody understood because that that this, this idea of playing first and second and being independent or like thinking of sub games where the second player actually went first in the sub game is really crucial for the rest of the workshop. So let's make sure we understand that before, um, before we move on. So yeah, I'm just pausing for any questions. If, um, did that make sense where you had a sub game where the second player went first? Okay, I'm gonna assume silence is a good thing. And that means everyone understood. So now you might be wondering where did I even pull out that number four from? Why does that number four even make sense? It turns out that it actually comes from the set of allowable moves. If you have, uh, if, if I can choose either one, two or three stones, then from the perspective of the second player, the number four always ensures that every move, for every move of the first player, I always have some move to counter it with. And the best way to think about this is to think about the smallest game with, I mean, the, the first non-trivial game, which is a game of four moves. You know, if the first player plays one, I can play three. If the first player plays two, I can play two. If the first player plays three, I can play one. And that's kind of where the score comes from. You know, in the given strategy set or the given moves or the given number of stones I can put, I can take away, four sort of ensures that there's always some move to counter with. And to get some practice with that, we're gonna look at a slightly more general problem called Alex and Bart. We're gonna spend about five minutes here Again, we don't expect you to code it, although the code shouldn't be too bad. It's maybe about four lines, but the, 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 the key problem, the key thing we want you to focus on is exactly what you're looking for, how to solve this problem. And you don't, you don't necessarily have to code it. Just try to find the pattern. This problem is really similar to what we just did. However, you, um, it's slightly even more general because there's also a lower bound. Now you can select any number of stones from two to five. So you may, no, you, you no longer have that. You, you may no longer have an option of selecting one stone. And just like in the, in the previous case we did. It's not as simple as a multiple of you know four or five. It's gonna be slightly more general than that. So hopefully you can find a pattern here. We're gonna pause for five minutes and also take some questions if anyone has any. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, so let's, let's look at the solution together. Uh, so the first thing I want to look at is what exactly should we replace the number four with over here? This number four comes from the previous example where we wanna see multiples of this number, right? 
maybe let's try let's try to use the same strategy over here. So we want to look at the states in which the second player can always counter, or the second player can always win. Since we can pick anywhere from M to N cards, let's think of a game with N plus N cards. You know, in such a game, and this this might be thrown completely out of random, but let's just look at it anyway. So who will always win in a game of M plus N cards? Well, it turns out that the second player always has a counter move because if let's let's look at the first extreme, let's say M is two and N is five. So M plus N is seven. So suppose you have a game of seven cards and the first player say plays one extreme, which is two cards, then I can counter that by playing five cards. And in the other extreme, if the first player plays five cards, I can always counter that by playing two cards. So I always have some sort of counter strategy when you have N plus N cards. Okay, so that's interesting. So we already know by the same reasoning before, like any multiple of N plus N cards will always be winning for the second player. Because no matter what the first person does, I can always bring them back to a multiple of M plus N. And this will keep repeating until we go all the way down to zero, where I am the one who plays the last move and I will end up winning, me being the second player. But there's actually more, right? Because if you think about it, we can also reduce the player to less than M minus one cards. And if you're able to reduce them to M minus one cards or lesser, then also are the, they do not have a valid move because the, by the definition of a valid move, we need, um, we need to be able to pick at least M cards because we can only pick cards from M to N. So if, if the second player is also able to reduce the first player to less than M, to less than M cards, then, then again, the second player wins because the first player has no more valid moves. This problem is slightly more general. Notice how in the previous case of having uh, you know, cards from one to some number N, that is just a special case of this because fewer than one card just means zero cards. So let's look at a more concrete example here. Suppose uh, M was two and N was four. So we're gonna look at, we already know multiples of M plus N already work for the second player, but let's look at M plus N plus one. This happens to be one lesser than uh, M plus N plus N. So, okay, oh, let's see what we can do here. You know, uh, I'm gonna again pull out my uh, Zoom friendly annotation here. And suppose the first player decides to scratch out two cards. Well, guess what? I'm gonna use the same strategy here and try to get the sum to six, which is actually N plus N. And I'm gonna go ahead and mark the next four cards to get this to, to make sure the sum, or rather the number of cards I've been removing is always a multiple of N plus N. But as soon as I do that, notice what happened. We only have one card left. And the first player actually cannot pick this card up because the first player is only allowed to pick either two, three or four cards. This is automatically losing for uh, for the first player. You know, let's let's see if the first player could try something else. Maybe the first player decides to, you know, maybe mark off three cards instead of four cards, instead of two cards. Well, in this case, you know, there's actually two ways I can win. I could either mark off all three cards. I could either sorry, I could either mark off all four cards. I'm just gonna mark them off more quickly, or I could actually just mark off three cards. And either way. Um, the second player, the, the first player again has no more moves because it cannot pick up zero cards for one card. But we're going to stick to our simple strategy. So can I always somehow still bring the sum to n plus n? So like for what games can I always bring the sum back to n plus n or a multiple of n plus n such that the first player has no more legal moves to play? Notice how, you know, we want the remaining cards to be zero to n minus one. In that case, the first player can never have or can, can never have a legal move. And it turns out this is, uh, let me go ahead and mark this off. Turns out this is, think of it really intuitively. If you have N plus N cards, we ju we're just gonna add zero to N minus one cards to it. So, the, so it turns out winning for second pair happens to be any game that is a multiple of N plus N, or it deviates from the multiple by a value between one to N minus one. What this means is that if we continue doing the same strategy where uh, whatever the first player plays, I always make sure that I bring it down to a multiple of M plus N. If we keep doing this, at the end of it, it's going to, it's going to be that we're going to be either left with zero cards or M minus one cards, so somewhere in between. But for any number between zero to M minus one cards, the first player has no possible legal move because it's only allowed to select something between M and N cards. This, is, this happens to be always winning for the second player. And you know, does every other move happen to be winning for the first player? In fact, that's actually quite true because 
just like in the previous case, if, the, if, if it is not a multiple of, um, you know, if it, if it wasn't a multiple of four, the first player could always do something to bring it down to a multiple of four for the second player. In this case, the first player can do something very similar. The first player can always ensure that it can remove some cards so that, so that the second player is now forced into one of these situations. Again, think of, the new, think of this as a new game where the second player goes first and has fewer cards to begin with. So if, you know, we can always ensure that the first player removes some number of cards so that the second player is always forced into starting, into starting a game with these number of cards, into one of these number of cards. And then, you know, we already know that in such a game, the, se the person who goes second in such a game always wins. So in this case, the person who went second in such a game happens to be the first player. So the first player is the one who's going to win. Okay, and the implementation couldn't be simpler. We basically take, we basically look at the remainder of, so K is the total number of cards. We look at its remainder when dividing by N plus N. You know, in the normal case, uh, where we're, uh, in the normal case, like in the previous one, this just happened to be zero, but now it could be anything less than M, less than M to guarantee a win for the second player. And anything else would be a win for the first player. So that's, it's as simple as that. And let's pause another 30 seconds here. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what I just said? All right, exciting. This means that either my information is really clear or you guys are really confused. Um, I really hope it's the former, but if it's if it is the latter by any chance, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself at any point. You know, all of the things that we're kind of working on kind of build up on each other. So we need all your intuitions up to this point to solve the next thing. But okay, uh, the chat's always open and you can always unmute yourself, no problem. Okay, let's go ahead and extend this toy example even further. I mean, you know, the first problem allowed us to generalize a little bit, you know, we're allowed to select more possible numbers but it always forced us to pick from a range. We're only allowed to pick numbers from some you know, lower M and some upper N. We cannot select you know, any arbitrary set of numbers, but maybe let's try doing that. So let's take this even one step further. Instead of a range of or, an, or an exact value, what if the players could pick cards from an arbitrary set of cards? For example, I could say, select any card, any number of cards from one, four or seven. Now there's no range, you know, I'm not allowed to select two cards. I'm not allowed to select three cards. I'm not allowed to select five or six cards either. I'm only allowed to select these discrete points that are one, four, or seven. This is much harder to find a pattern for because if you think, I mean, in the previous one, we always relied on the fact that removing a certain number of cards allowed the sort of, uh, gave us some sort of continuous space to work on. You know, we could look at all the cards from zero to M minus one and force the second player into a losing state. That is no longer the case. We have these points in the middle that are sort of missing. So this is gonna require a little bit more work and this is where we kind of want to motivate the thinking of winning and losing states. And before I get right into it, I kind of just want to introduce the problem. Um, so yeah, so firstly, okay, actually let's, let's talk about winning states and losing states first. And think of a winning state as follows. A winning state, as we defined earlier, is basically a state on which if a player lands, the current player that's on the state is always guaranteed to win. In the case of the previous example, if you had, say, if the game was a multiple of 12, then that game, you know, that game which is determined by the number of stones is always winning for the second player. So this always happens to be a losing state for the current player that's on it. For example, if the game, if the, pre if the previous game, the simple game of two stones had, um, you know, if you're on a state with 14 stones then the player that's on this on the state always is guaranteed to win just by the same strategy as before, you know, it removes some number of stones to bring it to a multiple of four and then it goes on and forth, goes so on and so forth. So suppose both players can select from one, four, or seven cards, and the game starts with 12 cards. Can we somehow find what a winning state and what a losing state is? Think about the outcomes of the first player's actions. And here, and let's, let's, let's look a little bit more closely at what a winning state means. If we want the current player to win this game, what does that mean for the second player, the player that goes right after the first player? Well, this means that whatever move we make, we want the second player to land onto a losing state. So a winning state is basically, a winning state is, win, a state is winning if there exists a state that I can transition to that is losing. So that would basically, and since players alternate, that would basically force the second player into a losing state. 
So basically, if you think about this recursively, a state is winning if any of its reachable states, and by reachable, I hear I mean, if I have 12 cards and I remove one card, then that may, that puts me into a state with 11 cards. If I, if I remove four cards, that puts me into a state of eight cards. And if I remove seven cards, that puts me into a state of, yeah, that puts me into a state of five cards. So the state of 11, eight, and five cards are all reachable states from the state of 12 cards. And for the state of 12 cards to be winning for the player that's on it, we want at least one of the other states, the state of either 11 cards, eight cards, or five cards to be losing. Because that would ensure that whoever played a move on 12 cards would force a player who plays a move on the on the on you know either 11, 8, or 5 cards to be losing. So this this you know this generalization is captured in problem C that Bashit's game. And we're gonna spend uh, maybe about 10 minutes here. But before that, I kind of want to motivate what I just said with a little bit with a little bit more of a wish for. So Let's try to map out the states, right? Just, just the previous example, you know, player one starts off at a state with 12 cards or 12 stones in the, in the case of Bashit's game. And if it removes one stone, it can push player two into a state of 11 stones. If it removes four stones, it can push player two into a state of 11 stones. And if it removes seven stones, it can push player two into a state of five stones. If you want player one to win, we want this to be a winning state, right? We want we want the player, we, if you want, I mean, whoever is on this state, if, it, if you want them to win, we want to ensure that this is a winning state by the definition of a winning state. But note that if this player wants to win, it needs to force player two to be losing in some way. So there has to be at least one state. You know, there exists at least one state that needs to be losing. And to figure out whether these states are losing, well, think about what a losing state means. A losing state means that any state that you could possibly transition to is actually a winning state. So no matter what you can do from a losing state, no matter what you try to do, you're always going to force the first player into a winning state. That kind of sucks. No matter like what, what you can, I mean, in this case, for example, if you were to remove um, one stone from eight or four stones from eight or seven stones from eight, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell it to you in this case, just give you like a little bit of peek, uh, a little bit of a hint. That actually means, it, it actually forces the second player. It always forces the first player into a winning state. So if there exists no losing state, that means that the current state that I'm from is actually losing. Okay, so with that sort of intuition in mind, uh, let's actually go ahead and spend another 10 minutes trying to solve Bashit's game. And I want you to think of this problem, you know, try to think of the smaller cases. Think of a game with only one a stone, then try to build your way up to four stones and, you know, six stones, seven stones, et cetera, and see how we can, you know, backtrack and look at previous reachable states. And see if uh, those reachable states, you know, in the, in the definition of winning states and losing states, help you find the winning states um, in bigger games. And once you're able to do that, um, you know, once you're able to think of this slightly more recursively, think about how you can you know, make, your recursive, uh, make your recursive code slightly more optimized by a technique we've discovered before. Okay, so let's go ahead and pause for 10 minutes. And uh, for those of you who are new, the technique that I'm referring to is dynamic programming. So see if you can, firstly, the first step would be to figure out, to see if you can think of this game in a more recursive fashion. And then we'll slowly try to convert our recursive, our, our recursive you know, methodology into something in, in, the, in the realm of dynamic program. All right, so let's go ahead and pause for maybe like eight or 10 minutes and then we'll go ahead. All right, let's, let's go ahead and try to find out how to solve this problem. So just like before, we're gonna try mapping out the states to try to get an idea of what this recurrence relation might be. And how do we look at the current state as a function of its reachable states, right? Because we wanna determine whether some state is winning based on its reachable states, based on the states we can force player two into. Right, so just like before, we want, you know, if, this, if you want the state to be a winning state, we want to ensure that there exists at least one losing state from, from, from its reachable states. And for a state to be losing, we want to ensure that there are, that <clears throat> excuse me that no matter what move a player makes from a losing state, it always forces the other player into a winning state. So that there's no losing move from a there's I mean if a, a state is losing, if there are no losing states from it. So let's look at a smaller example. Let's look at five. So suppose uh, again, and we're going to look at these states independent of players. You know, it doesn't matter which player ended up on the state, and that's exactly the beauty of impartial games. Um, and also some partisan games. 
But the idea is it really doesn't matter what player uh, lands up on the state. The game is uniquely determined by the state. And you know, whichever player determine, ends up on it, it just happens to be winning or losing from them, losing for them. But the winning and losing aspect really doesn't depend on the player that, that lands on the state. So, okay, so let's look at the case of five stones. You know, whichever player lands on this, it can either remove one stone to, to end up at a game of four. It can remove four stones to end up at a game of one. But can it really remove seven stones? You know, if I tried removing seven stones, that would result in a game of negative two stones. But that's obviously not a legal move because you cannot have a negative number of stones. And it turns out that actually the, the only legal moves actually pushes the, the game into a state, into both winning states. Because, well, why is four a winning state? Well, four is a winning state because the player on the state can simply remove four cards and win the game. And the player with, um, I'm sorry, I might be using cards and stones interchangeably here, but uh, this problem refers to it as stones. So I, I'd like to stick to stone as much as possible, but I might use cards maybe once or twice. And the player, uh, excuse me, the player who is forced into uh, one stone can easily win the game by removing exactly one stone. So these two are like, obviously winning states because they can transition into losing states for the other player by removing exactly the number of stones that are left. So clearly five is a losing state because no matter whatever the player, no matter what the player does at five, it'll always ensure that the other player wins, no matter what, no matter what legal move they can perform. So in that case, you know, player one's best strategy would be, and there could be multiple best strategies, but the best strategy would be just to play seven because once it plays seven and player two is forced into, into five, no matter what player two does in the second round, either removes one or four, player one can always win. Notice how we're kind of alternating between players, but the idea is that you always want to push the other player into a losing state as, as whenever you can. And if you know if player two played one, you know we're uh, the player one automatically wins, and if player two played four, then again player one automatically wins. <clears throat> so just to quickly summarize, a state is winning if at least one of the reachable states is losing, and a state is losing if all the reachable states are actually winning. <clears throat> And this, this is exactly what our recurrence relationship is. We can recursively find all winning states by the following recurrence. <coughs> so if you have a set of possible moves that go from M1 to Mk, so we have k possible moves, and the game has n cards, we look at all the possible reach, we, we, look, we look at all the possible states that are n minus m1, n minus m2, all the way up to n minus mk, for which the difference is non-negative. So we want to ensure that we can only make legal moves. So we want to ensure that the game obviously results in a non-negative number of stones. And we basically look at all these things and we look at if, whether any of these states happen to be losing. And if any of these states happen to be losing, then the current state of n cards is actually in fact winning. And if we try to solve this using plain recursion, you know, we'd be looking at a lot of the states again and again, because it's possible that we could, <coughs> excuse me, reach the same state from two possible states. And something that we talked about, uh, about three workshops before was dynamic programming. And that basically allows us to look at, you know, allows us to optimize our code by looking at the cases starting from the bottom up and building our way to the top, building our way to the, to the top. And we basically start looking at games with zero cards, which is our base case. So a, ga a game with zero cards is automatically losing for the first player because they have no more legal move. And then we work towards one card. Then from one card, we look at all our legal moves. You know, from one card, our legal moves is like only removing one card that ends up pushing the other player into, a, into zero cards. So one card is obviously winning and so on and so forth until we get to end cards. To clarify this a little more, let's look at the solution. So, you know, we're gonna ensure, we're gonna maintain a Boolean, uh, <clears throat> a Boolean array. And basically each game is characterized by the number of stones. And, you know, we have N plus one possible games from zero to N. And the first game, and we're going to basically, and this, this Boolean vector is basically going to store whether the game is currently winning for the, for the player, for the, first, for the first player, I guess, in some sense. <clears throat> and we basically start off by saying that game sub zero is false. That means that the player, that the first player, in this case, Stan, according to the problem definition, will always lose because, you know, Stan has no more stones to pick, so Stan will always lose. And then we, we iteratively look at all possible uh, games from one to n and look at all possible moves that, um, that, <clears throat> that, are, that are legal. So we start by, uh, by initializing a flag to false. This is basically going to be set to true as long as any reachable state is actually a losing state. If any of the reachable states is a losing state, we're actually gonna set the flag to true. And there's no point looking at any more, uh, looking at any more states and we end up breaking out of the for loop. And over here, we first check if the, 
if the move is legal by checking if we, if we remove M stones from I stones, is that is that some non-negative? And if it is, we can basically check whether that game was a losing game, was a losing state. So if that state was a losing state. And if that state was a losing state, well, what do we know? We know that the current state that we're on is in fact winning. So we can get go ahead and set that flag to true. And you know, there's no point in looking at any more states. And we end up breaking out of the loop and we set game sub i to is winning. So if there exists even one losing state, you know, we know that is winning would be set to true and the current game of i stones would also be winning for the current player. Finally, all we need to do is check whether the game of n stones, which is checked by you know, the state of n, if that is true, that, mean, that, that means that the current state is in fact a winning state for whichever player starts. And the player that starts happens to be Stan according to the problem definition. So Stan automatically wins. Else, if this, if, if this is not true, in fact, if this is false, then all the in fact wins because the second player can in fact um, you know, push the first player into a losing state. And that's the code. So I hope that made sense. And we're actually going to go into something super exciting. But before that, I want to make sure that you guys understood this. So I want to pause for like maybe 30 seconds. And uh, after that, we're going to move into something really exciting. So does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Okay, silence is going to be assumed to be a good thing. Oh, we have something in the chat. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Moving ahead. Okay, so, okay, great. You know, we, we kind of came, came up for solutions to these three games. And it seems like the dynamic programming approach really works out well for, uh, you know, for these games. You know, like Bashit's game seems to be pretty general, right? Like I'm allowed to pick any set of stones. And it seems like if I work my way using dynamic programming, I can always find who's going to win or lose. Turns out, in fact, that we can actually generalize this even more. And we're going to look at, you know, what if you wanted to play multiple games of Bash It together? For example, if I had like, if I was playing five games of Bash It's game simultaneously, and I, I define it to be losing for a player if the player cannot make any move across any of the games, you know, I'm playing all of these games together, then can I still figure out a solution to this? And it turns out that's actually not quite simple, but we're actually going to spend them hopefully the next 20 minutes and hopefully not much longer than 20 minutes trying to work our way to that. So in fact, it turns out that we can actually solve any impartial game using some technique uh, by analyzing the game of min. And that's pretty cool, right? It basically means that the whole class of impartial games can all be solved. And it turns out that all of these impartial games can actually be reduced to the game of min. So, every impartial game is actually equivalent to the game of min. And this concept of reductions or like finding similarities, equivalencies between, uh, between different problems is really fundamental. If you think about, uh, for those of you who have taken complexity class before, you know that you have this whole class of problems called NP problems. And I don't wanna go into more details about it, but it turns out that we can characterize all NP problems with one problem. There's like one problem that represents all the class of problems. And we're gonna try to do something similar here. We're gonna try to reduce any problem into the game of NIM, any impartial game into the game of NIM. And that means that if you're able to solve the game of NIM, then we can solve any impartial game. So then we can focus all our efforts on solving the game of NIM. All right, so I might have addressed NIM a couple of times without even saying what it is, but it's basically a game where you have multiple piles with some number of stones, and each turn the player must remove one or more stones from exactly one pile. So what a player is not allowed to do is, you know, maybe pick three stones from one pile and four stones from another pile in one move, but what the player can do is remove all the stones in the pile. So if you have a pile with say 14 stones, a player in one fell swoop could remove all 14, 14 stones in that pile in, one, in, in just one move. And then the player who cannot remove any more stones loses. So you know, once all the piles become empty, the player who ends up at that position ends up losing. And in fact, there are many variants of this game. We're gonna try to see one today in the contest problem called SNIM, uh, something that was supposed to be an example problem. Unfortunately, we won't have the time to do it, but we're going to look at some variants today. We're also going to look at a variant called Game of Cards based on its name on Caddis, and that's going to be pretty exciting too. Okay, so let's, let's quickly go over like a quick example just to make sure we understand how this game works. So we're going to have two players, uh, player yellow and player red. And let's start off by the first player removing all these stones. So the first player goes ahead and removes the entire first file. And then the second player who's player red or player pink ends up removing the, the first four stones of the second pile. 
and then they keep on doing this. You know, player three, the player yellow removes the next three stones off the of the of the new pile of the new third pile, and then player one ends up removing uh, all six stones from the second from the first pile from the first pile, and then the second player, the you know, the second player, oh, sorry, the first player ends up removing first the, the first four stones off the third pile. But wait, that was kind of a mistake, right? Because now the, first, the second player can remove all the stones in this pile. And now the first player is actually forced into choosing one pile. Remember that a player cannot just pass their turn. They always have to pick one or more stones. And they end up picking this stone. And now the red player or the pink player can end up selecting the last stone. And now yellow has no more moves to play. So player pink automatically wins. <laughs> okay, but you know, if you try to analyze this game, it's kind of tricky, right? I mean, you can have an arbitrary number of files. Each file can have an arbitrary number of stones. Where do you even begin thinking about this? There seems to be like an infinite or like a huge number of variables to work with. So let's try something simple. Maybe they just look at the case of one file. What if you're playing NIM with only one file? If you really think about it, this is kind of trivial, right? Because a person who goes first, remember, can remove all the stones. So there's only one pile in them, then the person who goes first can always win by just removing all the stones. And once they remove all the stones, the second player basically has no more moves to play because it's exactly one pile that's basically empty now. But this, this still sort of helps because now, remember that you can only pick stones from exactly one pile. So can you somehow think of this multi-pile mem game as multiple one-pile mem games played together? Let's think about it. Um, just like how I wanted to generalize Bashit's game to playing multiple Bashit's games together, think about playing multiple one-pile NIM games together. We will define a you know a state to be losing for some player if they cannot pick any number of if they cannot pick at least one stone from any of the piles that are left. So that's kind of interesting. So you know this idea of naturally composing uh, a bigger game out of smaller games is pretty natural in game theory, but it's also really tricky. Because how exactly do we compose these games together? And you know, one idea that we sort of thought of in Bashit's game was assigning each state as either winning or losing. So maybe I could try assigning each pile as winning or losing. And maybe I could somehow try composing, you know, winning piles and losing piles together to, to, to find out what to find out whether a multi-pile game is winning or losing for somebody. But you know, if you really think about it, that doesn't make sense because for two reasons. Firstly, there's no obvious way to compose two winning piles because we already know that a, a one pile NIM game is always winning for the first player, but that's always true for all the for all the one pile NIM games. So how exactly do we compose all these winning NIM, you know, all these winning states or all these winning piles into something that could possibly be losing for the first player? It really doesn't make sense. And, and actually, I would tell you a little bit in advance that it, there are, there are losing strategies for the first player. So it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't. There's no obvious way of composing these winning strategies to end up, you know, somehow coming up with a losing strategy for the first player. Second, you know, if you think if you if you try to if you try to give these binary classifications, like you know, either winning that is say one or losing say zero to these states, we lose a lot of valuable information because we we no we've no longer consider we're no longer considering the number of stones in each pile. If I give each pile like a winning or losing, I've completely lost information of the number of stones in the pile. So that doesn't, that, that's not good either. So instead, we're gonna try to come up with some value for each, uh, for, each, uh, for each pile, just like we are, uh, you could think of winning or losing as a value as well. But in this case, we're gonna come up with a whole number value and we're gonna call this a NIM value, which is you know, suggestively named. And we're gonna try to assign each pile some sort of whole number. Okay, but that's kind of arbitrary. Um, what could this whole number be? And before we get into that, let's also talk a little bit about composition. So the way we want to compose two NIM files or two games together is that we look at each, let's, let's, let's start with the most basic case, basic case of two one, one pile NIM games. The way we want to compose these NIM games is that if you want to find the NIM value of the, of the combined game, we somehow want to do some operation on the NIM values of the two smaller games to construct the NIM value of the bigger game. If we're able to do this, it works out really well because we can look at the smaller NIM games and then just somehow you know, do this operation on all the NIM games to come up with the NIM value of the, of the entire game. Okay, but now we, we, you know, it really begs the question, what possibly could the NIM value of a pile even be? And if you, if, if you really think about it, like what information do we even have to work with? And 
What distinctly sets a pile apart from another is the number of stones. Each file is only characterized by the number of stones in that file. There's really no other information we have to work with because you know, it doesn't really matter if a, if a pile was the first pile or the second pile. It really doesn't matter because of any player could pick from any pile anyway. The only thing that really matters in, in a pile is the number of stones. So maybe let's try, you know, I'm going to arbitrarily say that maybe the min value is the number of stones in that pile. And this might be counter, kind of counterintuitive, like why, I mean, shouldn't we, we be working towards finding this min value instead of guessing and trying to work against it? And you might be right, but, you know, it, it really helps to think about what information is available to us and trying to work with the information we have before trying to think of something more analytical. So, you know, the only information we have to work with is that we have n number of stones. So let's go ahead and think about that. Now in a one pile min game, if, if n is greater than zero, we already know that this pile is always winning for player one, right? Because the, play, because the first player can always pick up all the stones and that would force player two into a state with zero stones and, that, and they would have no possible legal move, which would end up, and they would end up losing. In the case of n is equal to zero, the pile has no more stones for player one to pick in, even in their first move. So that would automatically be winning for player two. <clears throat> and we want this property of, uh, you know, we want this property that, and you know, remember that n happens to be our nim value now based on our definition. We kind of want our composition of games to have the same property. We want to ensure that um, a game which has nim value greater than zero should be winning for player one while a name value of equal, a name value equal to zero should be for winning should be winning for player two. So somehow can we ensure that we somehow maintain this property while we even compose our games? And that'd be really nice because if we're able to maintain this property, we automatically have a solution. So yeah, um, basically what I said, recapping a nim value of multi-pile game if it's if that's greater than zero, you want that to imply that the game is winning for player one. Okay, so instead of we're actually going to try to guess what this what this operation could be, and we're gonna and the way we're gonna guess is by looking what you know what properties we want this operation to satisfy. And that's that's a very generic way of thinking. So let's look at some examples to kind of concretely talk uh, concretely talk about what I'm what I just said. Suppose you have two piles. You know, in this one pile nim game you have seven stones, and in this one pile nim game you have ten stones. And based on our definition of um, of, of, based on our definition of nim value, the nim value is exactly seven for the first pile, first pile, and the nim value is exactly ten for the second pile. But now I want to consider a game which has both these piles together. And again, I really want to compose these games by somehow composing the the nim values of the two games. So I want to compose seven and ten using some binary operation. Now I give I give this binary operation a fancy symbol. It really doesn't mean anything right now, but we want to determine what this binary operation possibly could be. So let's again look at the properties we wanted to have. Okay, firstly, it really doesn't matter whether we put the first pile after the second pile or the second pile after the first pile, right? Because whatever uh, player one could do to the first pile, it can just simply do it to the second pile, and similarly for the second pile. So obviously composing the first pile of the second pile is the same thing as composing the second pile with the first pile. And that, that is equivalent to saying composing uh, two games with nim value seven and 10, is the same as composing uh, a game with nim value 10 with a, nim, with, a, with a game of nim value seven. And we call this property commutation, uh, you know, commutative, uh, I guess, I mean, we call it, this property means that the operation is commutative. And uh, this is something we want this operation to satisfy because it clearly makes sense. Furthermore, we also want this operation to be associative. Well, what does that mean? That means that it doesn't matter how we, it doesn't matter in which order we compose these games. For example, I could have composed um, the, this, you know, this three pile name game of seven, 10 and 11 piles of seven, 10 and 11 uh, stones each by first combining, a, combining, combining one game by taking the, the pile of seven and 10 and then taking the pile of 11. Or I could have first taken the pile of 10 and 11 and then added on to the pile of seven. At the end of the day, we have only one game which has three piles, seven, 10, and 11. It really didn't matter how we compose these games. So again, we also want this operation to be associated. Third, um, and this is kind of like a trivial property, but it also makes sense to think about, is that if we compose the game with a game with you know, name value zero, then the game should just be the same. And this kind of makes sense. Now think about a game with name value zero, that is exactly the game with zero stones. And composing a pile with some number of stones with a pile with zero number of stones is exactly as if that pile didn't exist in the first place. So 
um, you know, it intuitively makes sense that a nim value of seven composed of a nim value of zero is just a nim value of the of the of the of, of, of you know of, of the first part of the non-zero part. Finally, and the most interesting property is that a pile composed with itself actually is always equal to zero. And let's let's see why this happens. So suppose you had two piles, both with seven number of stones each, or you know, both with X number of stones each. I'm actually going to say that this has a nim value of zero, the, the, the combined game. And a nim value of zero, according to our definition, means that it's losing for the first player. So why is this losing for the first player? Well, imagine the first player decided to cross out, um, <clears throat> decided to take off three stones. Well, what can player two do? Uh, player two do. Notice that there's an, there's an identical pile to the first pile. So player two could simply also remove three stones. And so now player two could maybe, you know, maybe player two decides to do take this pile. Well, the second player could just take the alternate pile and exactly remove two stones as well. And similarly, you know, now maybe uh, the first player decides to remove two stones. The second player can also remove two stones. The idea here is that for every move of the first player, <clears throat> the second player always has a mirror image move. The second player can simply repeat what the first player is doing. And that would always ensure that the second player always has a move, uh, always has a move after the first player. That basically forces the first player to take the last move. So that always forces the second player to take the last move. Because you know, you could basically just exactly every time the first player has a move, the second player exactly has a mirror image move in the opposite path. So you know, it obviously means that since the number of stones are decreasing, that basically means that the the, 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 the player that's going to end up with no stone is going to be the first player. So uh, I'm just going to, you know, this, this is a very important property. So I'm going to pause for 30 seconds to take any questions. Did the, did the fact that the second player always has a mirror strategy make sense? And again, you can always unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. <clears throat> Yeah, because this property is extremely crucial to determining what this operator could be. And I'm actually gonna ask you guys to think, uh, uh, to, you know, to guess what this operation could be based on your knowledge of CS or maybe map. But to be, I mean, to be honest, it's not super trivial. So I don't expect um, you to get it, but it'd be pretty cool if you knew it. Okay, seems like that was clear. So I can go ahead and yeah, so we basically, in summary, we want this operation to satisfy the following properties. It needs to be commutative, it needs to be associative. If we compose it with zero, it should be itself. And if we compose it with itself, it should be zero. So can anyone tell me what they think this operation might be? You know, uh, some, something you might've seen and maybe I'll give you a hint, maybe CS33 or, uh, uh, you know, maybe in uh, math, if you've taken, uh, you know, math 110A, <laughs> but, this property might, this, this operation might be familiar to you. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna maybe let you guys think about it for 30 seconds and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys what it is. All right, we have something in the chat and someone says XOR. That's brilliant, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that's exactly what it is and we're actually going to, uh, yeah, so let's actually go ahead then. So the property that really determines why this is XOR is actually the fall, is actually the last property, um, along with the others obviously as well. But um, given these, the fourth property uniquely determines that this is actually the XOR of the, of, of, the, of the quantities. And we're not going to formally prove why it's the XOR, but we're gonna look at what the definition of bitwise XOR is and see why this satisfies this following definition. And we're not going to go in the other direction. We're not going to show that you know any property that any operation that satisfies um, this 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 um, this uh, this identity would be XOR. But uh, we can talk about that more after the end of the workshop. <clears throat> okay. So look at let's look, let's look at bitwise XOR. And let's look at an example. Suppose we want to take the bitwise XOR of five and three. So now I'm, I've renamed this operation to XOR. And let's say we wanted to take the XOR of five and three, how exactly do we go about doing that? The first step is to write them out in binary. And that's sort of suggested from the name, bitwise XOR is basically take, doing something bit by bit. So let's first write five out in its bits. Uh, you know, five is basically uh, one in the fourth place and a one in the, in the zeroth place uh, to sum up to five and three is zero, one, one. 
And if you want to take the XOR, we, we basically follow the following rules. <clears throat> 0 XOR 0 is 0, 0 XOR 1 is 1, 1 XOR 0 is 1, and 1 XOR 1 is 0. And XOR might be a fancy term, but it is actually as a full form and it stands for exclusive OR. And the idea is that we want to take the OR of two values such that, such that, the, such that it's exclusive in the sense that notice when you normally think about OR, we consider like either this quantity that, or that quantity or both. But an exclusive OR, we're no longer allowed to consider the concept of both. We're no longer allowed to consider the scenario of both. So in this case, if both quantities are one, or in this case, if both quantities are zero, we, we, do, we, we actually don't like that state, or we don't like that con condition. So we, you could think of it as setting it to zero. In any other case where we, have, uh, where we have one, where we have exactly one, one, so we have exactly one of the two, then we set that state to one. And, we're, and then we again look at this bit by bit. So, we first do one XOR one. So you could think of this XOR operation being applied to each bit respectively, but we use the same operation for you know, doing it in combined bits or doing it bit by bit. So if you do one XOR one, we get zero. If we do zero XOR one, we get one based on the following rules. And if you do one XOR zero, we get one. And notice how this is commutative, you know, zero XOR one is the same as one XOR zero. So we end up getting six. You know, one, one, zero is, it just happens to be six in binary. So, or six in decimal. <clears throat> and so firstly, you know, before I proceed, why does this satisfy this following property? Why did it satisfy this property here? You know, x, um, x, x or x is equal to zero. Well, think about the scenario over here. Think about instead if, you know, if, instead of three, this is actually one, zero, one. So you have one, zero, and one. If I take one XOR with one, you know, following the rules, again, we cannot have two of the same, that would end up setting it to zero. And zero x or zero would end up setting that <clears throat> would end up setting it to zero as well. So this would also end up being zero. And one x or one will also end up being zero. So we're going to end up with all zeros over here. So if you if you take the XOR of one quantity with itself, you're always going to end up with all zeros. And this is this is exactly the property you wanted with our min values. <clears throat> okay, awesome. So I hope that made a little bit of sense. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to speed through. But if you have any questions about why XOR works and why we actually why someone guessed XOR, we can talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. All right. So a little bit a little bit more intuition of why this works because it seems extremely strange. You know, we kind of pull this operation out of nowhere, um, and we kind of want to compose our min values using this operation. But why why even bother? And why does this even work? So we're going to think about it like this. Remember that we want a losing state to have a name value of zero, and we want a winning state to have a non-zero name value, right? Um, can we somehow ensure this property is maintained uh, by using XOR? And in fact, it's true. So let's take, a, let's take an example. Suppose player one is on a state with a zero name value. So we want, this, uh, we want this state to be actually losing for player one. But how do we check it's losing? Well, we want to make sure that player two can always force player one into a state with a zero name value. But how is it able to achieve this? Well, notice that when player one removes any number of stones, it in fact, we can show that the XOR of, of this new state will have a non-zero NIM value. And that is because uh, intuitively, and we can go into more detail when we, uh, after the presentation, if we always remove some number of stones, we end up disturbing one of these bits, right? Because if we remove some number of stones, we'll end up disturbing one of these bits while keeping the other bits the same. For example, if you have two piles with five stones and three stones, if I end up taking maybe some number of stones from five, I will end up changing these bits. And since the existing XOR sum was all zeros, if I change some of these ones to zeros or these zeros to ones, I will end up changing the sum. And I will almost, and I will always make sure, I mean, you know, always one of these will always change to one. And that would ensure that at least one of these will change to a one in the, in the XOR sum. So that would mean I, will, I can always get a zero, uh, non-zero NIM value. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. From, from a zero NIM value, I can always get into a non-zero NIM value, sure. But it also turns out that player two can always go from a non-zero NIM value to a zero NIM value. In fact, there always is a move such that player two can remove some number of stones so that the resulting, uh, resulting NIM value or the resulting XOR of all the piles for the number of stones in each pile is in fact zero. And this is a little more tricky. It's a little more subtle and has to do a little bit more about the properties of XOR and a little bit about you know, the greatest, uh, the, the most significant bit of, uh, of a binary number, but that's something we can discuss after the presentation if you're interested. Uh, 
But basically, then you have this sort of back and forth game where player one has a zero NIM value and you know decreases the number of stones and forces player two into a non-zero NIM value. But from a non-zero NIM value, player two can remove some number of stones to force player one back into a, NIM, to a zero NIM value. So notice because of this back and forth game, player two always has a strategy that avoids it from being in a zero NIM value. If it can always avoid being in a zero NIM value, that basically means that player two can, can physically, I mean, there's no possibility for player two to lose because a losing state is, is categorically defined by a zero NIM value. If player two can always dodge a zero NIM value, we can, I mean, and since the number of stones are always decreasing, it always forces player one to always take some possible losing state. So player two can always avoid that losing state. And that is the core concept. The idea is like from a winning state, you always want to ensure that you can force the other player into a losing state. And here it just happens to be that a losing state happens to be a zero NIM value, while the winning state happens to be a non-zero NIM value. But what I want you to really remember is that a player is just forcing the other player into a losing state. And as long as it can do that at every turn, uh, we know that this player is going to win the game. <clears throat> just recapping what I said, is it possible for a player, player to ever lose? No, because the, because none of the states it's ever on has a NIM value of zero. And we know that the final state with zero piles and with zero stones in each pile um, is going to have a NIM value of zero. So well, what is our solution to NIM? Well, in conclusion, we kind of take the bitwise XOR of all the number of stones in each pile. If this result is non-zero, the starting player can always win. And if else, the second player can always win. And this is kind of mind boggling. It's like we, this whole idea of like an arbitrary number of piles and an arbitrary number of stones in each pile can be simply reduced to just looking at the number of stones in each pile and taking the XOR. This XOR seems to come out of nowhere, but satisfies the property that we wanted that you know, the zero NIM sum can always go to a non-zero NIM value, and a non-zero NIM value can always go to a zero NIM value. And the XOR really helped us there. But this is actually gonna be even more crazy because you might wonder that, did we just build all of this theory just to solve a single game? Like, did I talk about binary, XOR, all these piles just to solve the game of NIM? And it just happens to be a lot of theory. And you know, maybe you, you think I'm wasting your time, but just think, because you know, all, you, all you can do is solve like a simple game of NIM. Like, who cares? Who even wants to play NIM? But in fact, as I told you before, we can actually reduce any impartial game to NIM. And if you can reduce any impartial game to NIM, I can use the same XOR strategy to, uh, to basically solve any impartial game. That's pretty crazy. Like we have, you know, an, I mean, you could show that there's an inf infinite, number of, uh, infinite number of impartial games and I can reduce any of them to one game, which is the game of NIM. And then we, we just learned how to solve that game. So that's pretty crazy. But you know, before we were able to solve, uh, before we were able to solve, uh, you know, before we were able to solve any impartial game, we need to know how to reduce it to a NIM game. And this construction or this reduction is through is through this idea called Grundy numbers, or something appropriately named called NIMBERS. It's a really cute name, and it's bas it's, it's it's basically from the game of NIM. And yeah, so we introduce a, a few new terms. I'm just going to go ahead and click through them and explain what they are one one after the other. The first thing I'm going to talk about is something called the minimum excludent of a set. So the minimum excludent of a set is the smallest non-negative integer that is not in the set. What does that mean? Well, let's look at some examples. Well, if you have the set 0, 3, 4, the, fir the first non-negative number that does not occur in the set happens to be 1. So what we call the max, and it's also pronounced the max, the max of 0, 3, 4 is 1. The max of the set three and nine is zero because the first um, the first non-negative value that doesn't happen to be in the set is in fact zero. And in fact, if you look at the max of the empty set, the max of the empty set is also zero. But it's just vacuously true that the set has no integers. So the first non-negative integer that is greater than no integers is zero. And then we define something called the Grundy number. And this is defined recursively. We define the Grundy number of some state. You know, We define the Grundy number of some state X to be the max of the set of all the Grundy numbers of all the reachable states for X. Well, let's try to break that down one, one word after another, or one state, one cause after another. We first look at all the reachable states from X. So, you know, in the, in, in the case of Bashit's game, you could think about um, removing one, four or seven cards and 12 cards to get a resulting state or to get a reachable state of 11, eight or five. And then I look at the Grundy, no, Grundy number of all those states. And then to calculate the Grundy number of those states, I look at all, the, all their reachable states and look at their Grundy numbers. So this sort of goes down recursively. And in each stage, I look at the max of all the Grundy numbers that I've, that I've found so far, that I've found for the reachable states. And define that to be the Grundy number of, uh, of the current state. 
To look at this more concretely, let's look as let's go back to Bash's game and see how we could assign Grundy numbers. So earlier we assigned each state as winning or losing, but in, in this case, we're just going to assign each state a Grundy number. And okay, we're running really short on time um, and I didn't expect this workshop to go for two hours, um, but I'm gonna speed through a little bit more. So, you know, we have four stones. We can either pick one, two or four stones. How can we assign each state a Grundy number? Well, let's look at the smallest cases. Let's start with, let's start bottom up. Um, the, Grundy, the Grundy number of, uh, of the state zero, this happens to be the max of the empty state because there are no reachable states from the state of zero. So G sub zero is just equal to zero. So we replace all, uh, you know, all states with um, all states, all zero states with Grundy number zero. Then we look at the Grundy number of one and we look at the max of all its reachable states of all the Grundy number of all its reachable states. And you know, it's the re only reachable state is zero, which happens, which happens to have a num Grundy number of zero. So the max of that happens to be one because that's the next non-negative integer. Similarly, we do this for two uh, and then we do this for three and you know, even for two, in fact, the Grundy number happens to be two. But this sort of one-to-one -one relation between Grundy number and um, Grundy number and the state kind of breaks down in Bash's game when we arrive at three. Once we arrive at three, when we take the max of G3, G2, and G0, notice how uh, we only have two reachable states that have value one and two, Grundy number two, uh, one and two. So the max of these two values is actually going to be one. So in fact, the Grundy number of four, in fact, is one and it's not zero. Sorry, uh, sorry. The, the, the Grundy number of, of the state of three is in fact is in fact three is in fact zero and not and not three, as you as you as you kind of think. And then we basically have three possible states with Grundy numbers zero, two, and zero. And the max of this is simply one because one is the first non-negative integer that is not in the set of zero and two. Okay, but why is this number even important? Like it feels like it, it, it might kind of feel like I'm just throwing out you know new definitions one at a time. I started with winning states and losing states. Then you know we went on a dynamic programming and now we're at Grundy numbers and max. It really doesn't make any sense. But in I mean, okay, maybe you know it actually does make sense. I mean, there's, there's probably a reason for why I'm mentioning this. And the way it generalizes is something known as a Sprague Grundy theorem. In fact, it turns out that this Grundy number for the Bashids game is exactly what we're going to use to construct our one pile min game. And the way we're going to do it is we're basically going to say that if if a Bashitz game with four stones with possible moves one, two, or four happen to have a Grundy number of one, we actually claim that this, this game of four stones is actually equivalent to a one pile min game. So I could basically replace uh, basically replace Bashitz game of four stones with just a min game with only one uh, with one stone. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> so let's see why exactly this works. And it, it requires a little bit more of a formal proof, but we're going to intuitively see why this works, and we're going to leave the proof to maybe something we can do after the presentation if you have any time left. But basically, we're going to see that if g of x is equal to m, by the properties of the maximum minimum excludent, every number between zero and m minus one is reachable, right? Because this means that any that the Grundy number of all the states from uh, you know all the reachable states cover all the numbers from zero to m minus one. If that wasn't the case, then you know this Grundy number would have been something smaller because we look at the first non-negative integer. So if we look at the first non-negative integer and that's equal to n, that means all values from zero to n minus one are reachable. And here, you know, we normally think about reachable in terms of states, but here I'm saying reachable in terms of Grundy numbers because I want you to think of these states only in terms of their Grundy numbers. Like we said before, we're going to think of the Grundy number as the replacement of the Bashitz game of you know say n stones. With, uh, with a, with a, with a one-file min game of G of n stones. And yeah, so there is some state with that, with that, it's, that it's Grundy number. And if you think about it, the fact that we're, we're able to reach any number of stones from zero to M minus one is exactly what a one-file min game looks like, right? Because if you start with M stones, I am able to remove all M stones to get to zero stones, but I'm able to remove exactly one stone or something in between to get to M minus one or fewer stones. This is exactly sort of something like NIM, right? The fact that I can remove stones uh, using the concept of Grundy numbers is exactly equivalent to NIM. And the fact that, not like, I mean, I guess equivalent is not so quite clear, but at least one direction seems to be quite clear. That the fact that I can reach all states from zero to n minus one is exactly like NIM. And yeah, so that basically, I mean, we, we can't quite 
you know, decisively conclude that Dash's game with X-Tones is equal to a single name game with GFX tones. But I hope this intuition sort of helps you think about why this might be true. And in fact, you know, we could give a grant, we could define or we could give any impartial game or the states of any impartial game this Grundy number. And this Grundy number is exactly what it is exactly its equivalence into a game of name. Okay, but now what? We already knew how to solve Bash's game, right? Why did I introduce Grundy numbers to solve Bash's game? You could easily just do this using the state of winning and losing, just, just the concept of winning and losing. Well, it actually helps us generalize if we had multiple of these games happening together. Just like I defined before, suppose you had multiple of these Bash games being played together between the same two players. How exactly can I determine a winning strategy for player zero, or for player one and player two? Well, it turns out that don't we know how to solve NIM? We know how to solve multi-pile NIM by taking the by taking the XOR of all the NIM piles, of all of all of the NIM values of each pile. But now we know that each Bashed's game is equivalent to uh, each Bashed's game of X states, of rather of X stones is equivalent to a NIM game of exactly G of X stones. So to solve to solve you know multiple of these uh, Bashed schemes, I could simply look at the equivalent NIM games and look at their X. That's kind of again. I, I wish I had that name again, but that's kind of that's that's kind of mind-boggling again. Just we could reduce any game to NIM, and then just again just take a look at the XOR of all those NIM piles to find this to find the answer to the to the actual game. So again, in this case, you know, suppose you had uh, suppose we we're playing Bashed's game with. Uh, suppose we're playing four uh, four versions of Bashit's game, or like, and we're playing all of these games simultaneously, with seven stones, four stones, two stones, and nine stones. Then I look at the Grundy number of all of these, and it turns out I calculated these beforehand. The Grundy number of seven happens to be one. The Grundy number of four happens to be one. Grundy number of two happens to be two, and the Grundy number of nine happens to be zero. Again, remember that these Grundy numbers are very specific to the number of stones we're allowed to pick. We're only allowed to pick one, two, or four stones. So the Grundy number is uniquely determined by these things. And we and again we build them recursively again by looking at um, by by looking at their by looking at reachable states and looking at their reachable states and so on. Okay, so again, so the way we could solve a game of multiple Bashed's games is done by just taking the XOR of these of the Grundy numbers, which is equivalent to taking the XOR of the of the of their of their, of their equivalent NIM files of one, one, two, and zero. And it turns out in this case that the XOR happens to be two. Since two is non-zero, in fact, we can conclude that player one can always win in this funky game of multiple bashes. And yeah, and that is pretty much it. So the, you know, in summary, we could solve multiple bashes game by recursively finding the Grundy numbers of each game using, or we could use dynamic programming to you know optimize it over plane recursion. We could then XOR all the Grundy number of each game. And if this happens to be non-zero, then the player one has a winning strategy. Else, in fact, player two has a winning strategy, just because we already know how to solve NIM. And based on the strat based on the way we solve NIM, we already know this is true. All right, so that was a lot of content. Um, we normally, for those of you who are new, thank you for coming out. I hope you enjoyed this workshop. We normally spend the last hour of the workshop, or like hopefully the last 30 minutes to an hour of the workshop doing the contest together. We, we prepare a weekly contest for you all, but I have gone way over time. And that only leaves us with five minutes for questions and doing the contest together. But I'm really sorry about that. But before you all leave, or before uh, before we get into the mini con before we get into the weekly contest, we actually have a mini contest next week where uh, we actually compete for prizes. So the person, uh, the people who come first, second, and third um, across, you know, including the people's performance in the weekly contest, we actually are going to give out Amazon gift cards based on your performance. So we'd be really excited to see you tomorrow. Uh, see you next week. Uh, we're going to have one example problem from each uh, from each topic we've covered. Since we've covered six topics, they're going to be about six topics of varying, uh, six problems of varying difficulty. And we'd really like you to see you next week. So yeah, um, we have a um, we have a pretty big. Uh, I don't know if I should mention this, but we have a pretty big budget for prizes this time. So you're going to get some pretty cool rewards if you participate. So it'll be pretty cool if we see you next week. Okay. But before uh, before we move on to the contest, there's one uh, there, there are two tricky things that I haven't really mentioned that I really want you to think about. And if you if you kind of get stuck, you know we're always available on Discord or we're always available wherever you can find us on Facebook, Discord. You're happy to DM any of the officers. But it's like we we never thought about how to efficiently implement MEX. Like how do we find the MEX of all these available of, of a set, and how do we calculate the Grundy numbers? I mean, we already, you know, we looked at the recursive definition, but I want you to do, implement this using dynamic programming. 
Once you're able to do that, you have a very efficient solution to solve any game, any impartial game. And so if you're able to you know, effective, efficiently implement MEX and efficiently implement Grundy number, then you should be able to solve every problem on the contest and not get TLE. Okay, so those are some questions for you. If you get stuck, you know, we're always happy to, we're always happy to uh, help. But you know, before we get into the contest, maybe you could spend one minute, just one minute, not too long, um, just to get some feedback. You know, we really appreciate your feedback. Um, and we always try to improve our workshops quarter on quarter, in fact, week on week based on your feedback. So we really appreciate if you just left us. Um, it's gonna take you only two minutes, but just a couple of um, sliders and maybe some comments if you, if you like. All right. Um, yeah, uh, just gonna make maybe another 30 seconds. <clears throat> Oh yeah, great question. So yes, all our contests are still publicly available. Let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna link all of them on, uh, okay, you know what? You, I, I can just link them right now. But before I do that, let me go ahead and proceed to the next slide to the contest so people can get started. And yeah, so normally, yeah, we, we stay for the fun, but you know, we have an hour to discuss the problems together. I'm really sorry. I think we do not have that time today. Although I'm happy to stay around for another 15 to 20 minutes. And if anyone wants to solve problems with me together, you know, you can ask questions now, or you can ask us questions on Discord. But here's a link to the contest. Um, and Alyssa, in fact, every contest follows the same uh, format. And you can go ahead and change that six to any number between one and six. And you should be able to check, uh, you should be able to access every contest. But yeah, so um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, I can go ahead and tell you exactly what each contest covered so you know exactly the problems that, uh, that are part of each contest. So for, for session one, we looked at uh, problems to do with math, or actually not even math, but just ad hoc problems. You know, problems that have no, really, no real topic or no real algorithm to think about. You just, you just kind of rack your brain and try to figure out what the, what the strategy could be. For the second, for the second week of workshops, uh, for, sorry, for the second uh, for week two of workshops, we looked at dynamic programming. Uh, for week three, we looked, or for our, for our third session, we looked at a little bit more dynamic programming, and we looked at slightly more advanced problems, but not necessarily harder. Uh, for week four, uh, for our fourth session, we looked at graphs, uh, and for our fifth session, we looked at trees, and finally, this is our sixth session where we tried out game theory. So each contest specifically uh, has questions only from that topic. And um, as you, and you know, uh, problem A is usually the easier one. And as you go on to problem E, it usually, it progressively becomes harder. At least that's what we kind of hope for. All right, so again, thank you so much for coming out guys. I'm gonna, uh, I think the officers and I, or at least I are, I'm, I'm gonna be here for another, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, just to ask, you know, make sure you, you, I can answer any of your questions and just to make sure we have some time to work on these problems together because, you know, really that's where the true learning happens. That's really where we, uh, you know, these workshops or this content could be available anywhere. And in fact, you could get a stronger intuition maybe from some online resource, but we really hope that you sticking around doing these problems with us allows you to, you know, maximize your, you know, your time with ICPC. And since we've done these problems before, we have slightly stronger intuition of what might work and what might not work. We were definitely not gods. We have, I can personally say that I'm not that great at competitive programming, but I, I, I still think I can help you solve the problems that I've set for the contest. So yeah, uh, really appreciate you guys coming out and hopefully we'll see, we'll see you guys next week as well. <laughs>